yeah. if I look at my, I guess, the Twitter feeds about new new papers, <laughs> I, I cannot keep up. <laughs> yeah. Seems to me is like at the end of the day, how these architectures, how fragile, how brittle they can be, at very small changes that for a human will be no no internet affected. But if, if innovation occurs at the moment of ingesting data and detecting these type of uh, data points that are anomalous, that, that will be a, a huge win. So hello and welcome everyone to whosoever's listening to this particular podcast. Uh, today we have with us uh, Alberto Santa Maria Pang. Uh, Alberto is a principal applied data scientist at Microsoft, and he did his PhD uh, in computer science from University of Houston. And he has a long uh, experience and a career in research and development on various AI projects, including but not limited to medical imaging and deep learning. Prior to Microsoft, he was a principal scientist at GE Research, and he has led many research projects in industry and also government-funded projects, few of which we'll be discussing today. So, um, Alberto, welcome to the podcast, and it's finally nice to have you on the show. Uh, thank you, Jake. Uh, pleasure to be in the podcast, and thank, thanks for the invite. Yeah. All right. To, to get started, I think, uh, for people who might not know you, um, can you tell us a bit about your background? So, I think you have a long career in industry, but what was your background before you started into this industry? And uh, how did the process look like from being a new grad uh, employee at some company to now being a principal scientist? Yeah, th thank you for the question. And uh, perhaps I'll take one step back and maybe kind of provide uh, uh, some uh, ideas about my background starting from my undergraduate. Yeah. So I did my undergraduate in Mexico. Uh, I received my degree in uh, pure mathematics. And then from uh, that point, I, I wanted to leverage, I guess, uh, mathematical principles in applied sciences and in particular computer science, that was in my career path I wanted to follow. And along those lines, uh, the area that was of interest for me was medical, biomedical uh, imaging. But I guess kind of point here is that while uh, focusing on a theoretical, uh, I guess, uh, career path mathematics, there is a leap of faith in computer science what uh, the benefit of doing that is uh, if we understand it the mathematical principles, theoretical formulations that is allowing uh, or is kind of giving more flexibility in going deeper in some 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 areas. So my path started in uh, basically mathematics, Mexico, Mexico, I went to computer science. I was interested in medical, how the opportunity in working in biomedical imaging projects. Uh, from there, uh, I was uh, uh, looking for a research-based, I guess, uh, roles. And uh, I found one in the general lecture very interesting. And I have uh, was very fortunate in working on projects related on research and development that span different areas in the industry, going from, from healthcare to aviations, uh, inspections, and, and others. Uh, and then the, I spent uh, about 12 years of my tenure in GE research and developing uh, uh, analytics algorithms applied to different uh, areas. Uh, and then recently just joined uh, Microsoft about uh, one, one year and a half. Focus is to understand principles of methods, techniques applied uh, to a specific, to uh, uh, imaging or uh, healthcare in the context of uh, scalability in, for for cloud-based solutions. So in that sense, in that sense, I guess one of the, my main roles in in Microsoft as a uh, principal applied research scientist is to be as uh, to act as an ant operator between research groups and product teams where we cannot create an, a new an instance of a new technology that will go all the way from, uh, I guess, design, development, all the way to production and maintenance. I see. Interesting. And I think uh, you did mention about your interest in medical imaging. Was there was there like a particular uh, experience or instance that made you interested specifically for medical imaging? Like I think you have a background in mathematics and computer science, which is fairly engineering based. Like what was that particular experience that made you very intrigued about uh, applications to medical imaging? Uh, thank you for asking, Jay. So it's a kind of a personal story uh, to that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was uh, always uh, uh, interested in medical. Uh, incidentally, uh, when I see blood, I guess I'm not very receptive to it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I guess uh, one of the main uh, for, uh, one of my main points in my personal experience was I had a, a fracture of a of a bone. Uh, I ended up in an ER 
I had mm -hmm. surgery. And uh, at that point uh, in my life, I, re I re realized that technology, uh, computer science and mathematics can actually do help. Uh, yeah. help providers and help uh, people in general. So yet at that point in time of my, I guess, personal life, that's where I decided I wanted to pursue uh, that, that career path that was by the end of my uh, uh, graduate, uh, I'm sorry, of my undergraduate studies. Mm -hmm. But I guess that kind of set the, the point. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, that's 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 very nice to know. Like, I think a lot of people I know uh, are like getting into this field by this particular inception. So I I, I think uh, it's it's wonderful to have like a personal motivation in this particular field. Yeah, and 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 talking more like uh, this is well, this is one thing. This is like a personal uh, curiosity also. Like I see uh, like at least for research projects, I have seen this title principal scientist. It could be either like I think in your case, you're an applied data scientist, but the broad definition of principal scientist revolves a lot around people who are involved in research. So can you tell more about like this title itself? Like how does this title fit into the whole uh, food chain of people who are involved from, uh, I don't know, the most highest people who uh, think about these projects versus uh, relating to all the software engineers that are uh, on the bottom of the food chain, like basically who implement these stuff and what does this role look like and how does it fit into the project's uh, life cycle, at least in research? Yeah, thank you uh, for asking. Yes, yeah, so I guess there is kind of overall uh, overall uh, concept or picture about the principal uh, scientists, and then there might be different roles uh, or specializations. Uh, I guess one of the main, uh, at the broader level, one of the main roles is about collaboration and innovations, uh, collaborating with different teams internally and externally, research from product teams, program managers, stakeholders defining ideas, shaping ideas, uh, also talking to business units uh, and uh, suggesting best practices or what may be kind of new product generations uh, in the business uh, as far as kind of uh, new, new new products and services. So I guess it's, uh, and uh, there are different uh, mechanisms in how a, a principal scientist this might fit in different type of organizations, but generally speaking, that's one of the main uh, roles in my mind, I guess, at the high level. Right, right, right. And and does it like how how does your routine look like? So like you mentioned a lot of things. Uh, there are definitely like more things that we can imagine about these projects that you just mentioned. But I think each of them take time. So what does your ideal routine look like? So if you are starting on a project that's completely new, what are the major things that you will be doing? And what will like basically what are the deliverables for a, for a principal uh, scientist? Because I have on I have seen like how I report to a principal scientist, but I don't know what what does the deliverable of a principal scientist look like that he or she reports to their uh, uh, their manager or whatever whatever the title is. Yes, uh, so the, I guess the, the, the liberal wise uh, it depends on the specific uh, program, mm -hmm. but uh, at the end of the day, it's all about the impact. Mm -hmm. uh, having impact in the product, having impact in the customers and, uh, and in the technology as well. Uh, so I guess deliverables, are, maybe I will try to resume in this uh, one, uh, moving products from uh, new technologies providing technical guidance, uh, domain knowledge, and pushing the state of the art to improve uh, a specific product or service. Mm -hmm. So that that is, at the end of the day, I guess, uh, one major trend. And there are different ways in how this is actually achieved, depending on the programs. So there are programs that they require a very hands-on, uh, I guess, approach. So uh, expectation-wise is that the principal scientists will also be coding, will be coding along the lines of developers or researchers. There might be some of the programs that are uh, perhaps not well-defined or not defined at all. So expectations are that uh, the, a program will be defined in the uh, along the lines of asking the question, what will be the minimum requirements for uh, setting an idea? Will mm -hmm. that be a, a meaningful and measurable milestone? Will that provide a baseline for subsequent programs? Or uh, there are not other type of question is, what are the technologies within organizations that are usable and potentially uh, impactful? So I guess uh, depending on the different tasks or, or specific goals, there are uh, different uh, ways on how this can be achievable. But at, at the end of the day is how can we impact products and services? I see. Interesting. And 
one uh, one one question like specifically i think again uh, this would vary from teams to team but uh, how, is it like what drives these particular projects is there often a uh, uh, curiosity for like theoretical explora- exploration in terms of research or is it specifically only to maximize or optimize a particular business need like what drives a particular project would the team be at all interested in like just just for the sake of exploration right like you pick figure out a theoretical problem saying that oh hey um, i just want to see how these particular functions would optimize using a deep learning like how do i optimize for a better loss function or something like something something i think people in academia work for but is there it, could there be a possibility where people in industry or uh, people who lead these projects would be interested in certain uh, kind of deliverables like these yeah and our thing is uh, effectively a mix of both Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess, uh, and there are different ways of how this can be initiated. Let's can be initiated about how can we sp- improve a specific uh, service or product. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that will set a roadmap, a strategy, on how we can execute and a, uh, push the state of the art along those lines. There might be other, uh, I guess, there might be other uh, ways or uh, roads in where we say, well, we want, uh, we have an ideas about uh, pushing the state of the art about a, a new technology, uh, we know uh, we have the necessary feasibility on that. How will this help a, a specific product or what will be the roadmap for it to, to be a product? So I guess uh, this, uh, at the end of the day, is a blend between th- these two components. It might be initiated either by one or the other. Right. And I think, um, like, I mean, uh, a lot of people would also want to know is uh, these rules don't come with like a technical guidebook, right? Like, I think even when when we do uh, PhD, like I'm, I'm doing my PhD and you also did your PhD uh, sometime back, these kind of uh, definitions and defining these uh, KPIs and all those things for research projects, they don't really come. Like, I think uh, there's there's no course where you can do that uh, TTC, okay, you will be doing these, these things. So what was the process for you like? Like, how did you end up learning these things? that are uh, an addition to as in doing PhD, right? Like in PhD, we already know like how how we are supposed to work, how we are supposed to present our results, uh, talk about it, publish those and like talk more about it. But how how did you learn these uh, subtle characteristics of uh, a particular person who is working in the industry that has other obligations? Yeah, no, that, that's a very, very, very good point. Uh, thank you for, for asking that. So uh, I guess maybe just to maybe to backtrack a, a tiny bit. So yeah, most of these problems, you know, all they are not well defined, and they have never done before. So in that sense, there is no the specific approach that we that we might try as a as a template. Mm-hmm. I guess perhaps kind of the closest that we can rely is on the analogies to previous product uh, pro- previous uh, uh, programs previous problems and uh, understanding what is generally speaking the state of the art uh, today and uh, i guess what is uh, th- that is kind of one uh, road map along the approach to this type of problems uh, second is on the uh, collaboration so mm-hmm. and understanding what uh, other people have worked on similar uh, problems, how can uh, I can leverage? I guess my personal experience, but I can, but also I can leverage the uh, the experience uh, and the technical competence of my entire team, and the teams that are I guess uh, have the same uh, technologies. So these two components, I guess these two main axes, might be. Uh, a path uh, in how we can approach these type of problems. And many times it's about uh, trying an idea, uh, failing quickly, understanding and improving, uh, getting feedback from, from the customer, a collaborator, and improving, I guess, on, on an iteration basis. So that is, is a process, it's not like a one-shot a specific, uh, I guess, yeah. a trial. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I I agree to that. And um, like just to add on to that particular thing is like I I did uh, my intern at Amazon uh, this summer, and I learned a lot of things in in the sense that I was working on a project that was like in the in the works for many years. And when I learned about like I think they have these documents where they document everything that they tried, and uh, it it was only I think third week or something when I learned what uh, what the other things people have tried, and there were so many things that like 
teams worked on and i think more than 15 people worked on it and things that didn't work or maybe didn't work up to the expectations and then when i learned like okay most of these times industry don't publish publish these things but they are working on so many things and like you said like you you iterate over these things like you try out things that don't work you take a step back and keep on doing so exactly. yeah but from the outside it always looks like the industry worked on this they had immense amount of people who worked on it resources and bam you have a very good result so yeah um i i completely second that uh but uh, you you also have been like in, in your experience you have been working as a principal investigator on several uh, government pro- funded projects like i think uh, darpa that we were talking about last time and so i'll i'll talk about these projects also in detail but um how does how does these two roles differ so you have been a principal investigator i know my professor is a principal investigator so i kind of know what she works but still i won't say i, I know 100% of what uh, she works on but how do, how does these two roles differ so uh, being a, a principal scientist versus a principal investigator what are the what are the uh, uh, mindset switches that you might have to do like if i if i tra- travel you uh, like switch you back to a principal investigator what are the things that you will immediately change in yourself that hey oh i am not a principal scientist anymore i can't do that i have to do this or something like that yes no so thank you for asking so i believe there are uh, there is significant overlap with, between these two mm-hmm. uh, the the main one i will say uh, is a passion about the technology be really caring and believing in the technology and having the technical competence in executing uh, i guess uh, in my mind kind of the most uh, meaningful similarities are uh, create, having an idea uh, from 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 the ground establishing mm-hmm. what idea what technology might actually be uh, useful for understanding what are the limitations what is might be viable in the short term what are the technical gaps what are the risks and then uh, having a strategy uh, execution on on initial use cases uh, from there i guess uh, darpa is extremely rigorous in setting metrics uh, uh, technical i guess uh, understanding the technical approach uh, and uh, the uh, what might be the uh, actual risk associated to that Mm-hmm. and uh, and perhaps something that is some uh, that should be we should be i guess pretty mindful in that way it's about the budget uh, and mm-hmm. resources how can mm-hmm. you achieve those goals with the with a, a reasonable budget and and timelines so i guess from the tactical perspective uh, is is very similar from the strategic uh, or i guess perspective this uh, i see those uh, analogies i guess running in parallel uh, mm-hmm. perhaps from uh uh from a post posterior stage or a post wise stage uh in, in the programs that are associated to principal roles like in industry that are very specific towards a product or or, or mm-hmm. a service where as in, in darpa it might be a exploratory base it might be on 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 the idea of pushing the, the state of the art and uh sometimes those uh programs the most successful meaningful ones they may have i guess kind of follow ups uh, i guess uh, uh su- subsequent uh, efforts but uh, uh i would say uh just in short uh, the most similarities are in just in the strategic point of view conceptualizing the idea the technology uh is strat- uh tactic wise executions and i guess perhaps kind of the most different one is on what happens after or uh after that program uh, what will be the scale needed to execute it uh, what will be the uh, the pos- possible customers potential customers that we may be impacting and and then will be another question how will be maintaining those infrastructures after i guess executing and and provided to customers interesting interesting yeah <clears throat> yeah and, i can uh, imagine i'm i'm yeah, sorry and, and another yeah. another point uh, i should have mentioned is also publications yeah so publications is also in the scope of of roles of principal scientists uh is is i guess is the from the program perspective is very useful to do to disseminate that, that technology uh so that might be also uh, a common Uh, a common point with i guess government funded programs in the, and in general about uh, uh, career paths for i guess for principal investigators and researchers in, in general yeah yeah i think um uh, i i agree to that and i think that's uh, 
as a phd student i really like that about uh, uh like government funded projects because most of my projects that i work on is like funded by nia nih or dod and like b- before i joined as a phd student i used to uh, monitor these uh, professors publications and they publish like um crazy right like yeah, they are publishing every every month or so and i figured out like why do they do like what's the motivation right like they have these many publications like what what does in- incentivize them and when i actually uh, started uh, attending these uh, dod meetings and nis meetings that's when i learned like it's it's like a deliverable for them like they have to yep. publish and like uh, they are at the point at the stage in life like where they don't really care about publications but they have to publish it's like a requirement for uh, i think renewals for these kind of uh, uh, grants and everything so yeah uh, i i agree like publications is like a biggest uh, driving factor for these projects yes and i should say something that at microsoft we cannot try to secure this also open source so we can yeah. try to publish and provide i guess a full uh, a path to fully reproduce that scientific experiment from the mm-hmm. point of providing the, uh, access to the source code to data sets uh along uh, with i guess for their technical support but but i guess publications data sets code is is pretty meaningful yeah yeah I agree I agree and and I, I think you also did mention about your collabs so I think uh, and in general like I want to learn in general and also more about your collabs uh we, we talked I think we talked offline where you said like you 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 and your team have been collaborating with John Hopkins University and I mean that makes sense like because it's like one of the biggest industry places that works on medical imaging uh, and AI AI projects so uh tell me more about these uh, particular collabs as in like what are you working on and what's the collaboration if it's not confidential like what what are uh, these two institutes who are like really big in the, in this space and what are, what are you working on and also also comment more about like how do these collaborations work in general where industry and academia are combined what are the uh, what are the expectations from both parties like as in what does the what does the academia want as in like the professor or some people and versus what are the expectations from industry and why do these collabs come in the first place like what was the need like why wouldn't be it completely industry or completely uh, academia so yeah I, I I know I throw a lot of questions, but feel free to take them as you want. <laughs> so th- thank you for asking. Yeah, certainly. So we have an, an active collaboration with Job Hopkins uh, University. Uh, in uh, particular, in this particular case, we have very close collaborations with an imaging group uh, for uh, uh, functional MRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, analysis that is led by uh, Professor uh, Craig Jones from the Computer Science Department. Uh, and then the, the main scope of this project is in uh, helping how we can transfer or implement medical uh, workflows that will automate uh, uh, some uh, specific uh, need in the in a hospital. Mm-hmm. So we are working uh, with uh, Dr. Harris Harder, which is the uh, uh, chief of, uh, of neurosur- neurosurgeon in the John Hopkins. So th- in that scope, we have a specific uh, medical need uh, for which a patient is required to uh, be on an MRI mm-hmm. and have um, an, uh, a, pre- a diagnosis and also have a planning about uh, a surgery. A neurosurgeon. So I guess I guess what I'm trying to say the specific, there are two specific needs. One is the need from the uh, from the medical uh, use case in this case, and uh, the the uh, the well, I guess from from Microsoft and I guess from the if they can take back from technology perspective is very helpful in understanding what is the use case in achieving that workflow what is kind of how technology can help in improving healthcare uh, uh, i guess r- routine uh, just uh, uh, i guess uh, day to day diagnosis making it faster better and improving uh, I guess the accuracy, repeatability of those uh, of those uh, steps. Right, right, right. And and um, in, in terms of as in uh, exploration, like w- do these kind of collabs also explore? Like, does the end product look like like a product or something, or is it like more on publications? As in, like, I want to explore this research problem and publish some new findings on that. Uh, Actually, it's both. So okay. I guess there is uh, there is a scope and uh, it's on a scientific discovery uh, that is one, yeah. and then the the other is on the 
the end product will be uh, an automated uh, process mm. in, in a hospital. But I guess kind of here, kind of the main idea is to try to understand a, a use case, specifically in the context of a cloud-based analytics. And we want to answer the question, what will be the use case for using cloud-based technology and AI to optimize a medical workflow? What it will take to develop that tool? What it will take to deploy it? What it will take to, uh, to uh, maintain it? Uh, I guess uh, understanding these use cases will be very useful. And then in the context of generalizing yeah. to more, I guess, uh, to, to more uh, use cases that, that are similar. Right, right. Interesting, interesting. And I think, uh, yeah, I think you, you, you did mention about cloud-based AI applications and that intrigued me a question, which I want to take it very slow is, first of all, I want to know as in a lot of people, th 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 there could be like many articles that people publish and also blog articles, news articles where they hype up the idea of AI and medical imaging, right? So they say like, oh, AI is going to replace radiologists and they are going to revolutionize the medical research and all those things. But at least in, in my personal experience, I have been working in this uh, in this field as a very uh, newbie but still i do feel like uh, ai is more like a complementary thing like it, it's it's helping people in medical research but i want to ask that same question to you because you have been in this field for long where do you see the uh, promise of ai the most because a lot of people will say hey this is going to be great 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 but when when we see from an outside standpoint, we don't see many applications. Like I, I won't be able to find many uh, hospitals. They would say, oh, we are running the latest unit model. Like we don't see that. Of course, publications, we get a lot of citations for sure. But the like, do you, like since you have been collaborating with industry and academia for a long time, do you see a very strong promise that, hey, people are very looking forward to using deep learning models in their real world deployment scenarios? Uh, correct. Yeah. As far as the, uh, I guess, adaptability uh, and the impact of uh, uh, of deep learning and analytics, as far as kind of technology, perhaps the most uh, meaningful came uh, 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 against the, the impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I see is there as a, using that as a productivity tool, not mm -hmm. in the context of replacing a radiologist or not replacing a human expert by the final decision point, but rather is that a radiologist can improve and do, can improve their work, can they do it better, is easier for them. And can we uh, democratize this, uh, I guess, uh, the healthcare uh, as, as an industry? Can we yeah. make it more accessible and, and faster and better? Because mm -hmm. not at this point about specifically about replacing uh, uh, radiologists or humans, and uh, in in that context, I guess in academia publications papers, uh, there are, uh, is 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 growing day to day. There are new capabilities that are demonstrated every day. is is amazing, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I guess to translate that into a an clinical practice. As an end point, uh, there is a, a a technical gap that is it requires to be addressed. Up to them. Um, and can you but, talk more about, yeah, yeah sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask a question, like, as in, like, can you talk more about the technical gap, as in, what are the limitations? Like, because people might not know, like, what what do these challenges look like? As in, why am I not deploying uh, a, a model that can classify healthy versus diseased patients using a deep learning model, even though the models that are published are like, they have great accuracies, like, and at times they do also uh, a, a, a comparison where they are doing a radiologic uh, connections, right? Like qualitative results where they will give the same MRI scans to a radiologist who has like 25 years of experience. And they will say that, hey, our machine learning or deep learning model is performing better than a group of five radiologists. So as an as a, as a outsider, it feels like, hey, deep learning model performs better. Why don't we do that? So what are the technical limitations and what are the ethical lim limitations in such cases that you have seen? Yes, uh, thank you for asking. So as far as uh, uh, technical limitations, uh, this is what I call, I guess, uh, uh, developing AI in control environments on mm -hmm. static data sets, whereas uh, deploying and maintaining uh, AI in the wild. My point is that when we uh, do, when a, when a researcher is trying a new data set, a new method is under uh, con uh, uh, troll circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, a limited data set, and basically, we're proving we're pushing the, the state of the art uh, as far as uh, research is concerned. But uh, then taking that idea, that control environment, 
and deploying in a production environment in a hospital with day-to-day -day data with new variability uh, I guess uh, coming in uh, multiple sources of uh, uh, inputs uh, models uh, they they tend to break so mm -hmm. I guess uh, th that might be just kind of one technical gap is just the variability from going from proof of principle and research base to actually having this in production. Uh, of course, the, the might be, it's debatable how much uh, this can be, uh, I guess, what is the magnitude, order of magnitude of, of this issue? And it also depends on the type of problem. Uh, that might be uh, one. Uh, the second is also on the, assuming that that is achievable, there might be a, a second part to this, which in my mind really has to be with explainability and uh, uh, interpretability that ultimately is addressing how uh, humans, in this case, radiologists, physicians, can build confidence in AI. Uh, main point is that uh, in many, many cases, uh, the AI is, uh, is, is essentially a black box algorithm that data is going in parameters are estimated and there is an output. But as a physician, as a radiologist or a biologist, uh, someone may want to ask, why does it work? Uh, what, uh, why, is it wor why is it working well in these cases? Why is it failing in these cases? So I guess my point here is that providing uh, an output, it, might, it is not sufficient for building that confidence, that trust from uh, uh, someone that is practicing to uh, an analytics uh, model that is being deployed. So mm -hmm. th there is a, a technical gap there that uh, also in my mind should be addressed in how are we are deploying these models in a way that are uh, understandable, uh, explainable uh, mm -hmm. by by humans. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you bring this topic and this is very interesting to me. So I, I have like already uh, two or three follow-ups. And the first one is basically, uh, th this this topic has been explored a lot, right? Like explainable AI. But if you see in terms of very strong technical definitions, we still don't have a very nice uh, technical definition that researchers can work on where they can define a model that is exactly explainable because the idea of being explainable is from zero to a very analogous value like why how do i or when do i call this particular model model explainable right like it's it's like basically do you want a model talking to you in plain english that says hey, hey this is what i'm thinking and blah 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 but it it, it seems very uh, unfetchable so in your loose definitions and feel free to uh, take this to any definition that you want like if 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 i was developing an explainable model what would be the um, set of metrics that you will give me, except for like the thresholds and confidence scores that we get from a deep learning model that will be enough for a radiologist to suffice that say, okay, now I do understand what the model is doing. I, I, I'm just to throw it out. I think there are a few methods that are, that do work well. And again, there are pros and cons of all these methods, like uh, class activation maps, uh, line models and all those uh, scenarios. But I think it really gets tricky when we are using neuroimaging data, right? Like, because there are only few methods that can help uh, the backward propagation methods. So yeah, uh, like in, in your understanding, and industry applications, what would that X factor be for deep learning models to go from uh, low confidence to high? Yeah, th thank you for asking. So it, in my mind, I guess uh, there might be several, as you mentioned, but, but I guess uh, 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 what I will think about that, they're the, they're the easier to understand our, uh, attention maps. Uh, mm -hmm. by, by radiologists, if at least uh, an area is highlighted of a decision uh, for for what for that classification, uh, a radiologist, uh, I will understand that uh, mm -hmm. at, at the very basic. There might be others that uh, it might provide a subsequent output in terms of uh, inter interpretable language. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, I, I worked in technologies that are uh, referred as emergent languages. And one of the uh, benefits of these technologies is that the models were trained and uh, deployed uh, so that they were providing uh, in classification a segmentation, but we're providing a symbolic output that is easy to read by a human, easy to uh, interpret from a human. 
And that symbolic output is similar to how, uh, how we, in humans, we build a sentence in the context of symbols with some precedence as far as semantic semantic meaning. But, but I guess what I'm saying, uh, uh, semantics are uh, super important. If yeah. that interpretability can be mapped back to the semantics, to the specific classification, the specific uh, uh, task from, from the model, and related back to the domain knowledge from the end user, that will be useful. It might be, I guess, different ways how, how we can that, that can be implemented, but uh, generally speaking, that that is one one path. Uh, the the other is really just to say, well, if I work, if I use these models under uh, known circumstances on training sets, I obtain this type of outputs. I can understand, but in my mind, it would be more interesting to say, what happens if I provide a network and model that has never seen before, and is capable of giving me an answer why that is different from the previous cases. So if, I guess if uh, main point here is that if we can ask the models to do some type of minimum reasoning, not mm -hmm. as the extent of a human expert, but at least to the point that a minimum reason that provides insights about data distributions or how, how data points are significantly different or, or, or close to in the context of unknown data, that will be in my mind a, a, a step forward towards that. I see. Yeah, I really like your first idea, as in, like, yeah, in in loose terms, uh, these these ideas have been thrown, but it made more sense, as in, uh, boiling down an explainable um, output into specific symbols that radiologists or any domain people can understand. So having like a structure to a particular um, explanation that is boiled down to symbols, and yeah, that that makes a lot of more sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and and the other, I think there is a counter argument uh, where people say, I mean, I, I'm definitely on your side. I do agree to these, but a counter argument is uh, people who, are, who have been a very pros for deep learning is they say, we should rather be focusing on validation and verification of deep learning rather than focusing on interpretability and explainability of these methods, because it's hard to um, boil down these uh, huge models that that are modeling nonlinear associations and having like a gradient based back propagation method is like uh, it's like basically boiling down the whole magic of deep learning to like a very standard binary outputs. So there are these two uh, counter arguments. Basically, the other person is saying um, uh, we should rather focus on uh, validation because that's how like if you see any statistic, uh, sorry, uh, I would say traditional engineering methods, we we develop a method that works and then we heavily invest ourselves on uh, uh, validation, verification, quality analysis, and all those things, right? To see where the system breaks and then we fix it. So do you do you think um that should be our major focus or but still or still we should be more also relying on interpretability or whatever we just mentioned? I, I, I believe it should be a mix between both. I see. Yeah. Uh, I, that, that will be my, that will be my thinking. I guess uh, by advancing interpretability is is kind of one part of, of the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is uh, the, we require something. This we require this in order to advance the the methods, the state of the art. But also the same part, I guess, we require verification, right, and, and validation. Mm -hmm. uh, that is in the context of deploying uh, models, uh, and then up, I guess, uh, uh, just yeah, analyzing data at the large scale. Yeah. But uh, this will uh, provide, I guess, these two access. Uh, one is from the strategic standpoint advising uh, technology and perhaps the other is on more on, on the kind of execution path the technical tactical path right. but uh, at the end of the day for me it's kind of a uh, a combination of, the, of these two makes sense makes sense and 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 on, on one thing i also wanted to touch that we didn't get a chance is basically when we talked about ado adoption of these techniques right so I, I, I do also know that you you started working before the big uh, era of deep learning, right? Like before 2012, when things uh, started to get really heated up uh, in deep learning space. So, and 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 I was recently involved in doing a review study, right? So uh, I see a lot of medical papers that have been using uh, support vector machines and the basic machine learning techniques very confidently versus when it comes to deep learning a lot of people when you submit these papers they don't like the reviewers don't really understand the idea of deep learning because it's too much complex to understand and what's really going on so 
I, as a, as a very newbie and a new to this research, I do understand like people have much more confidence on uh, these simple interpretable methods. Like if you throw logistic regression or support vector, or even I think uh, decision trees at some point, they do really, uh, they do on a very fairly regular basis. But how do you see the adoption of shallow learning versus deep learning? Like as in when you throw these models and I, I'm, I'm not sure how people have been using these transformer models because that's like the new big thing like even I think not a lot of people in CS research understand how these transformers are replacing CNNs or if at all they are doing that so do you do you see the adoption patterns like when when you were there I think uh, post 2012 do you see a very positive sentiment of these techniques being used or is it still criticized or critiqued very harsh uh, when we use in these interdi interdisciplinary research? Uh, yeah, the, I guess the, the short answer is yes, I see the adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, and then mainly is uh, because with these new technologies and in particular with deep learning, we have solved problems that we were not, uh, uh, they were they were solvable, but I guess not at the magnitude that, or the accuracy that is, is, is done today. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps I guess to put things in context, I will see this as as kind of uh, the uh, what DARPA calls the wave, the tier three three waves of AI, mm -hmm. and how we are evolving uh, through those. So I mean, to put it in perspective, is kind of the first wave is basically a rule based uh, handcrafted rules. Mm -hmm. uh, second wave is about uh, statistical inference, uh, and that it really is along the lines of shallow learning uh, with big data. Uh, so models are trained uh, on the specific data sets uh, with big, big data uh, at a large scale. Uh, the, the third component to this is kind of the, the third way of AI. But I guess to put in perspective, the way I see deep learning is between the edge of the 2D and, and the, two, the second wave, at the end of the two wave and the beginning of, on, on the third wave. So main yeah. point is that still we are uh, deep learning models. They are still doing the statistical inference, right? We're estimating uh, parameters at a number that was in, in, that not imaginable before. Yeah. Um, but again, but still it's a statistical inference. Yeah. So from, from there to ask the question is, is this model has kind of a, a truly semantic meaning of, of that concept uh, it, that re remains to be seen. I guess kind of in the context of the third wave, uh, the idea is to say, uh, if a second wave in shallow learning, deep learning, uh, I'd say that uh, I have the task of teaching my, my daughter uh, what a uh, dog, or what is the concept of a dog or a cat. Uh, according yeah. to, the, to the second wave, I will I, I will show a thousand pictures of a cat, one of those I will say, oh, you get it, right? So, yes, I get it. In the third way, the concept, or I guess kind of the, the vision will be, I can show maybe five pictures of a cat, five pictures of a dog. Maybe I can draw a sketch of these two. And I can explain through words, through concept, through language, what that concept is. And, and then and then the, the, someone will say, oh, I get it. So I guess the point is that uh, the, in the third way, perhaps we are, are focused more on reasoning using prior knowledge rather uh, more on the semantic meaning rather that in just kind of uh, full statistical inference at that, that at that point right but, but, but i guess just you... to but, but sorry but just to answer to this question yes so i see the adoption but i guess yeah. also i see a, a progression in how this can be projected right right but in, in in the space of ai uh do you do you think like you you did mention about you uh you would want to see the third wave right like where we are making sure the concepts are learned like like how humans do do you think we are still at that phase of ai where uh because as we see like deep learning models still requires huge data sets to learn right like the basic concepts versus like you said like if you showed a photo of infant like even we can just see one photo of an animal and we can quickly identify like a similar animal and label them versus it still takes a long time we have seen a lot of failed cases do you think um uh, like this is i think this is much more uh, related to ai ai specific question but do you think we are at that phase of where we can boil down a concept of anything to an AI model and can learn in fairly small data samples. Yes, absolutely. In a, in, a, in a specific cases, uh, absolutely yes. But I guess the, the challenge here is to understand what does it take to generalize to more more use cases. So I, I guess that progression wise, uh, that I see kind of a roadmap that we are making great steps towards that. But still, uh, it remains to be proof zero shot. Can I do it from one yeah. concept? 
two concepts or, or from one specific domain to a totally new domain. Uh, yeah. in the context of, for example, learning from natural images, learning from, from to medical images. C can we achieve that? Or, or not just in, in that, I guess, a specific use case, but might be more on video analytics as well, right? Cases that are totally unseen. So I guess I'm kind of thinking more on, on the latter. Right, right. And, and 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 yeah, talking about concepts, it also uh, uh, leads me to one more question. Like, which I I mean, since I'm on on a similar track in research, I I wanna uh, also wanted to know is is there any evidence? Like, if you have been working on many projects, like, do you have do you have seen any instances where AI has contributed to some kind of uh, discovery, as in something that um, researchers or medical professionals who have been doing their own uh, set of techniques for analysis and all those things didn't figure it out, but but deep learning was, or machine learning, I would say, machine learning broadly was able to find patterns that is significantly useful to um, uh, progress this field. And one, one instance, I mean, everybody knows is DeepMind, right? Like they have, they published the alpha fold and it did a great amount of uh, havoc that, hey, it solved a long lasting medical research problem. But that is like, again, a very ambitious project that uh, a lot of people worked on. But the whole different field have you seen any instances and if, if you have any like can you share any instances so that people know that yeah this has some potential yeah absolutely and in particular i have worked maybe in one use case uh, at least is in the context of uh, molecular pathology but okay. i guess here kind of the idea to provide some context so uh, uh, one of the main challenges today to understand uh, how cancer operates at some level is to measure what is heter heterogeneity of cells, cancer or no cancer, in terms of uh, genetic uh, genes and conditions. So in the context of providing a breakthrough, uh, say a personalized therapy for cancer treatments, we uh, the analytics need to make a measurement at the cell level uh, mm -hmm. of very large, uh, I guess, kind of, uh, sections of tumor from the microscopic level and, and uh, model correlations uh, different, uh, I guess, gene expressions and uh, optimize uh, a function or a criteria that might be derived from a, a drug treatment or, uh, or survival. So I guess uh, in the context of uh, life sciences, molecular pathology, basic biology, basic cancer research, uh, machine learning has been uh, a, a success story in mm -hmm. how we can derive uh, better outcomes for patients in, in the context of uh, uh, leveraging these statistical models uh, for large scale uh, for driving and understanding molecular pathways that mm -hmm. might optimize uh, drug treatments. I see, I see. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, there are a few instances. I think even for projects that were, when like even even though I knew what I was signing up for, only later when I was I was working on these projects, I realized the potential. And like it's it's not even not even just for the sake of fun. Like I think there are some very uh, nice analysis, like pseudo analysis, I would say, based on machine learning results. And I'll I'll, I'll, I'll just just for the sake of conversation, I'll, I'll share an example that uh, my collaborators were working on. Is basically at Mayo Clinic, they are working on headache data. Data. So we have migraines, concussions, uh, post-traumatic headache. And the the bad thing about from a medical research standpoint is like they like based on like there, there is a tremendous amount of lack of data. So it's hard to generalize any results. And the second thing is like they are not able to find any patterns using existing methods, as in like what symptoms or what brain regions are causing these issues. Because if they want to develop a treatment, they have to know, right, like which uh, brain regions are affected and hence they can do these. And based on, and it's a huge data, it's a, it's a, it's a huge data as in like it's a high dimensional data because we have MRI scans. So it's hard to analyze. And yeah, they, they, like we are exploring these idea of AI that like, can we localize regions that are specific to a disease phenotype but like you said most of these times like these classes are very heterogeneous so it's like you have so many patterns even just for like cancerous versus non-cancerous and in our case it's like basically healthy patients versus any kind of disease patients so you'll see if you have a data set of 30 or maybe 40 individuals but so many different types of migraines that it's hard to even build a classifier so um, yeah but uh, the sure. the applications are very very motivating. Uh, correct, exactly. So it depends on the I guess uh, use cases heterogeneity, and uh, maybe just to uh, brainstorm about some other applications, uh, text analytics. 
yeah. uh, is uh, is a field that is uh, is a, I would call it a success story. Uh, that's a very good example in my mind in how deep learning has been uh, tremendous valuable in processing large, large amounts of data, conversational data, yeah. uh, providing insights about uh, sentiment analysis, but identifying entities, uh, providing a complete analysis of, or I guess, of a semantic input into uh, a structure I guess semantic input from not the structured data to a structured a standardized data up to up to some degree. Mm, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I I cannot agree more to that. So yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, and in terms of uh, like, uh, I, I do find a gap also at times when uh, people who are publishing work uh, from an academia with medical AI applications, do you see there is something, uh, any anything that's wrongly focused in academia for medical AI projects? Because uh, I often see there are a great amount of uh, publications who never make it to a real world use case. I mean, the ratio is definitely bigger, but in your experience, you, you were in academia previously and now you're in industry. Do you find any kind of work specifically not useful saying that now from an industry standpoint, if I publish something or do a certain kind of technique, you might as well say like, hey, great results, it's published, but it doesn't it doesn't make it to the real world. This won't work because of X, Y, Z reasons. Do you see any patterns or do you have any uh, any uh, insights that, hey, don't don't focus on these things. These These are not real world scenarios. Yeah, for, for me, it's uh, hard to say or hard uh, where to put the threshold. And uh, for, for the main reason is that uh, sometimes you came across to a publication that might not be related to a specific interest. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it might not be uh, relevant in the future. So, mm -hmm. so, so I guess uh, what I'm saying is like uh, one is a scientific rigor, uh, methodology. And then the other is on the uh, the, uh, the end application or no application at all. But, but I guess what I'm saying, uh, we don't know th whether that might be relevant in, in the future for some other idea. Hmm. So uh, in, in that case, I take it with a salt of grain. Uh, yeah. Don't try to, to disregard, but yeah. rather uh, just uh, keep it in, in the, uh, as, as, a, as a backup or as an extra resource. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And 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 in terms of like again, a real world scenario is like how do you how do you comment on these big mo big models that are coming out, like the GPT three and all those things? Like, do you do you feel uh, they would have uh, they would have like uh, industry application scenario where potentially companies because it takes uh, it takes so many millions of dollars to train these models and even testing phase like people like industry uh, sorry academia won't be able to dabble with it like i think it would be the industry experts who can do that but do you do you see from a result standpoint like even if uh, all those computation costs put aside do you do you see these big models are going to stay here for like a potential application or they would still remain in the academia to research and then maybe fine tune and when 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 something that's very uh, you know engineeringly less 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 weighted would be used in industry do you how like in general do you have any comments for big models yeah i guess my my, my approach uh, to to big models is that uh, so it it takes uh, effort uh, financial effort and uh, resources effort to come up with these models uh, to to bring uh, i guess uh, to use bring the data to train those models and uh, as far as kind of the use cases uh, this is where i will uh, maybe in my mind i will be guided by ethics and mm -hmm. uh, asking the question uh, what uh, fr from the ethics perspective is where this model kind of is uh, make sense to use uh, as far as we comply that boundary in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that, to me, that will be kind of the, the, the best practices or use cases of models uh, is uh, in the future, uh, but I guess with uh, computer power growing every day, with the storage growing uh, every day, uh, in my mind, there will be a path that uh, uh, these models will be, uh, I guess, uh, developed uh, by different uh, groups or organizations or academia in in the near or or medium term in the medium term uh, yeah. that's what i guess we will kind of try to understand uh, that's where we if we have a good base and good understanding where we, we where we can apply those models with an ethics based uh, formulations where they actually might might lead into the future once i guess they are more predominantly adopted mm. Mm, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I. Uh, it, it makes, um, 
much more sense as in how how do these uh, because I, I I see these like I I think I was reading like when GPT three came out and it it made public to a lot of researchers to try out these models. I initially like being a very uh, skeptical about it. Like I was like, what what's the use case scenario? Like this would be just uh, a game, right? Like uh, like just people who would be like to play and put in some words and it will generate out te- uh, images. But uh, I think I was reading on Twitter and one person mentioned like this would be a very pro- uh, very quick proof of concept for people who are artists so let's say mm-hmm. you are you are an animator or something like uh, let's say you want to project an idea to someone and you want to say uh, i don't know simpson simpson uh, sitting in a bmw something like that so it will take me one day or something as an artist to create that image for you versus if i can do that in few seconds it will just expedite the process of creative people and i was like damn i didn't i, I didn't uh, catch that particular because i have not seen those scenarios right like people who have experience might see that hey it can be used in endless scenarios but again it, it comes down to the weightage of like do do like spending millions of dollars on training a model and the use case is like a quick proof of concept would you would you still consider and with all the i think there is also this uh regulations on uh environment right like training these models how much does it affect the environment and all those things but um yeah i'm, I'm i know it's an open-ended topic so um it's it's definitely interesting to learn thoughts yeah and it just kind of goes back i guess to the point that recently on dali correct taking that as a, as a use case there was a, a contest uh, about design and uh, artistic design and someone submitted a picture from dali uh-huh. in the contest and it turned out that it won the first place uh oh, wow so so i guess uh th- this is kind of a recently uh uh on, on i guess on, on the media it uh to my best of my knowledge, is about three weeks old or something like that. But I guess this is kind of pointing to those to a number of use cases mm-hmm. uh, where uh, we where we are. I guess is where we cross the boundary whether a human generated that data and how actually it can be used, yeah. and also the the end use to that. Uh, on on the I guess on the resources to train those models, we are hoping that these are foundational models. Hmm. That, uh, that we hope that if the, with the right applications and and the and the right use, then uh, we can save uh, resources and uh, uh, when we have to kind of generate a, a new task, rather than training G- G- ten GPT trees, can we say can we train a foundational model, and hmm. we have a different number of applications, uh, perhaps to medicine or detections or, or or just generating art or something similar, rather than training ten GPT trees, can we just spend a fraction of that and, and have ten GPT trees specialized? Yeah. So I guess that's where I see also how this can be be playing out in the future. Right, right. And, and not only that, but the data data sets, right? So yeah. ultimately, I guess the data sets wise, uh, uh, this is what might be kind of giving us those 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 capabilities. Better data, better models. So mm-hmm. another question here is how can we also think about these data sets? Mm-hmm. How can we make them shareable? Or what is kind of unique and ca- characteristic from that data set that led to such a good training model? Was uh, domain knowledge that we use, or was the use of specific, uh, I guess, uh, insights, or or was just kind of purely data driven? So that might be some something else to consider. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the like I I I uh, I love that idea, and I want to extend that particular thing for uh, medical scenarios. So. We all know, like this is a very known fact, as in lack of data sets is like a biggest uh, roadblock for medical imaging uh, applications. But of course, as a researcher, we don't try to treat them as uh, roadblocks, and we try to work around. But what are the unknown unknown insights that you have that goes into these kind of scenarios? Like, of course, people know that uh, lack of data sets is causing issue. It's not that people are uh, deliberately are trying to hold onto data sets. But what are the challenges? Like, why do we have la- lack of data sets? Uh, like, why do they arise like in standard computer vision applications we never complain about data sets i mean we do generate data sets so that no not a lot of people complain about it but uh working from uh, our di- different standpoints like how do you have any insights like what are what are these typical scenarios that cause these lack of data sets yes uh, in my mind uh, there are different uh different scenarios and the different root causes uh one is interoperability interoperability 
So mm -hmm. having, uh, I guess, in the medical domain, many different medical devices with different standards, different medical imaging modalities, uh, different algorithms for producing images, for calibrating the devices, uh, this leads to a very heterogeneous uh, data set. Uh, mm -hmm. On top of that, I guess, if we add uh, the uh, the regulations that uh, make, uh, I guess, so on data privacy, that's uh, uh, another uh, something to consider in how, in understand how we can share and access those, those data sets and what will be the, the implications um, mm -hmm. of that as far as kind of data privacy. But I guess uh, something that perhaps uh, is, is, is being, um, is still kind of an exploratory phase is to say, okay, well, medic medical imaging, we uh, data sets are somewhat uh, relatively well constrained as opposed to natural images. So yeah. we know the variability, we know that along is not going to have a star shape, uh, things like that. So I guess kind of this is kind of making the point in understanding in the, how we can generate models, I guess, from synthetic data. Not entirely from 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 real data. So I guess this is where we can uh, say, well, we have a so we have a, some domain knowledge. We have uh, some some concerns that we can leverage and turn us into our favor. C can we use those to have kind of a new approach or or, or different approaches? And uh, how can we train models? Uh, we know that there is uh, not sufficient data sets. With real data, but can we can we generate some synthetic data? It doesn't have to be entirely realistic; it just has to be good enough for the models to learn. Yeah. So, so I guess there are some other some other kind of viable paths that still kind of can be further improved. That still they are not quite a mainstream up today. I see. I see. Makes sense. And 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 I also want to uh, connect back. I think one of the points that it intrigued me a question was I think you talked about Dolly. So uh, and not related to that, but uh, like there was at least a, a, a scenario in everyone's every researcher's life when they saw deep fakes, right? So deep fake videos and all those things, and everybody got concerned. Even the people who are working on AI, they understand the model; it's not dangerous. But when we saw deep fakes and in applications, it's scared. Do you do you uh, overall feel scared about the application of AI since you are working on medical imaging projects? Do you, as a researcher, even though we know how these models work, they are not they are not miracles they are just uh, a mathematical big function but do you feel uh scared about the application of ai and misusing people misusing it in any kind of potential way that we as an engineers might not have considered yeah absolutely so i am concerned i am concerned every day <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so i guess sometimes uh, there is a misconception that deep learning so this this i guess uh, ai based models are uh, bulletproof or they can be used for uh, i guess in, in many different contexts but uh, i guess it's it's important to be aware of uh, of the limitations and and, and the use cases uh, on the uh, deep fakes, I guess I'm, I'm concerned. But if I, I will, if I have to, if I go back on my list of what things I should be concerned of, I guess uh, the the one on top, of, one of the tops in my mind, on top of my mind is about how fragile these networks are at the end of the day. Yeah. In the sense that yes, you can train a model, can get you 100% accuracy, it can be extremely reliable. But what happens when, uh, from the moment you start kind of maybe just changing, uh, it's likely to use the pixels manipulating the image in such a way that for a human, the uh, change is imperceptible, but this is entirely throwing off the model. So, so I guess kind of my, my, one of the main concerns to me is like, at the end of the day, how these architectures, how fragile, how brittle they can be. At very small changes that for a human will be no, no intended affected. Yeah, and perhaps this kind of goes back also to the point of kind of the second wave of AI and the third wave of AI. If these yeah. models will involve reasoning, I guess at, at the higher, uh, more, I guess more uh, on on the semantic uh, and semantic meaning, then we are we will hope that they will be less prone to those. Yeah. 
and i think this also ties to the uh, question that we had we discussed is like the adoption right i think these kind of scenarios mm-hmm. make it much more like people who are deploying these models they they these definitely go against that like if if these kind of perturbations in the input data can throw off the predictions then we don't really trust because real world data is not going to be pure and processed right so um, but but since you have been working on this like how do you think do you think we need to have like a methodological innovation or an like an architectural innovation in order to improve these methods or yep. should it be just a uh, post hoc verification process right like where i have uh, strict processes of uh, just eliminating that hey it didn't work in these scenarios and hence this uh, architecture is not working or do you think we still need some innovations yep i, I believe we still uh, we still need a lot of innovations <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, yeah. in my mind we require a lot of innovations and and i guess from a practical standpoint uh, uh or from a technical sp- standpoint they might be coupled i guess to the core core i guess architecture but if if innovation occurs at the moment of ingesting data and detecting this type of uh, data points that are anomalous, that, that will be a, a huge win. Not not only because of that, but also because it might be provide insights about data quality. Most yeah. of the I guess uh, failure cases is not just because Monsal, but it's because just uh, the 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 data quality or the, the input signal is 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 something something completely off. Mm-hmm. But, but I guess what I'm saying, so in my mind, yes, so we require uh, a lot of innovations. Uh, this is uh, almost like an arm race. Uh, new new tampering methods are coming up every day. Uh, cybersecurity is a concern. Uh, and then uh, if, if we are going to be deploying uh, these models uh, at the largest scale, then we, we have to have these uh, failure, we have these safe systems in place. Yeah. And not only detection, but also in how to programmatically, how, how to understand how we can uh, just uh, Im- make algorithms, workflows immune to those cases. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'm, I mean, as a, as a researcher new in this field, I feel this is like a good news, right? Like at least I have something that I can work on and like it's not definitely a saturated field because it's it's very hard. Like I, I don't know how uh, it, it, it's, uh, it resonates with you also, but uh, just the space of AI and deep learning, let alone not just the pure deep learning, but AI and deep learning, you feel so much saturated, like people are publishing so much stuff. At times I feel like, do I even have a novel idea that I can work on? Because if I, if I come up with an idea that that, hey, I want to do that. I search that and I'll, I'll see some archive paper that has already tried doing that in a very nice sense. So it's always it always feels like the field is saturated. But I think there was a uh, there was like a sinusoidal time in my life when I started. I feel I felt like oh hey, applications of AI and deep learning. I don't find many people working on it, and hence I'll make an impact. Then I started reading papers, and I feel like oh, this field is so much saturated, so much saturated. I, I feel like I don't have a chance for contributing, and then now I feel oh. All of these models that are so fragile, like you said, like these techniques are so fragile, not that they are bad, but like we just need so much of iterations of these, like we need multiple people to improve based on these published results. So, yeah, but I, I want to know, like, do you do you feel uh, compared to other disciplines, does this feel receive an enormous num- amount of submissions and people publishing stuff with easy access to gpus nowadays so i think uh, a, a tweet that mentioned like all you need is a gpu so like do you do you agree to that or do you do you, do you still uh, are you still optimistic with the idea that hey we, we still need more submissions uh, i will i will think uh, we need uh, more submissions okay. and uh, uh, and uh, I partially uh, disagree in the good sense with only gpu yeah uh, access <laughs> because uh, is data access yeah uh, and nowadays, uh, I guess the access wise to public data sets uh, is, uh, is is tremendous. Anyone can access, download uh, data uh, from different, uh, I guess, uh, specific domains and applications. Everyone, uh, I guess, processing power is becoming a commodity. Yeah. Uh, so I guess these these two components are just uh, uh, enabling, uh, I guess, the innovation and uh, the number of ideas of applications that are coming up day to day. Yeah. If I look at my, I guess, at the Twitter feeds about new new papers, <laughs> I cannot keep up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but but also it kind of makes me think if uh, we we try to understand what the failure cases, what are the limitations, what are the risks of these technologies, then this really opening, I guess, on the flip side, the door of saying uh, what are kind of the the new directions that we might actually follow, what are the yeah. technical gaps that need need, need to be others. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, and also I think uh, it's definitely, we won't be uh, reviewing all of them, but as in, uh, at some point we also do realize like some of the, uh, like uh, as you read more and more papers, you realize some of the papers don't really are up to the standard of like our research. But nowadays, since the applications are so much we we tend to publish and it's an over it's an overhead for people who are reviewing i think my my uh, other advisor was like a reviewer for cvpr uh, for many years and this year he gave up because it's like he said like it's it's too much like it's it's hard to take on and the even from a submission like a person who is submitting to cvpr i have known like a lot of students who are like at the age of me who are reviewing and i mean i do like to review but it's like definitely a very bad case scenario for a submitter like because if if i don't have the experience of this field how do i review how do i make sure that uh, my reviews are gonna add on to that particular I, author's uh, list yeah I, I i am on the same page uh, so sometimes <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of kidding that people should come up with a new competition about yeah. uh, taking all the previous i guess uh, submissions from cvpr or, or, uh, or a conference and turning models about what papers were accepted and, and not. <laughs> <laughs> and where, yeah. Yeah, I guess we can kind of generate the, the recommendations, but I guess that, that would be kind of something, I guess, uh, uh, I guess be beyond joke, I guess it, uh, the joke. Uh, I, I totally hear you, just uh, there, there are so many things uh, coming up. It's, it's very yeah. hard, hard to keep up. And uh, no, yeah. I guess quality wise is, yeah, it's, it's very extremely heterogeneous. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want to ask one more uh, open-ended question before mm -hmm. before we go on to uh, the other questions is um, uh, a lot of like, I think many past research is like, if you see MRI, I think I forgot, like, was it MRI or X-ray? I think that was developed with a different intention. Like it was never invented with the invention of analyzing body, but I think it was some, some physics related research that people came up. And then later someone working in medical research took on that particular thing. And I think MRI became like the biggest standard, right? Like there's no, nothing better in terms of analyzing human uh, biology, but like these are the scenarios where you see inter interdisciplinary research uh, getting inspiration into other other researches. Working in bio research, like I think you are working at the cross section, you are trying to improve uh, two two particular fields and come to a conclusion. Do you feel working on these projects they have uh, induction into CS research? As in, can we can we get inspired by these problems and focus on using that as an inspiration to optimize for algorithmic uh, novelty? Do you do you uh, ever see that, or is it hard to find that in medical research no, problems? Uh, absolutely, uh, in my mind, yeah, uh, it's. Uh... It's uh, easy to see it and easy to find it. Uh, <laughs> there are different different examples, but I guess this is kind of uh, asking a similar question about uh, applying science and just pure science, right? Or pure math or or applied math. And question yeah. is whether applied problems can also push new authority boundaries on, on theory and, and I kind of put it back as far as can the methods. Uh, my, my thought is that uh, new, I guess, new microscopes, new, I guess, instruments are uh, generating more data every day, but I guess more data in the context of more resolutions, more insight, and uh, at a scale that we have never seen before. Mm -hmm. So this is really kind of pushing the limits of what are capable today, as far as theoretical tools and algorithms to analyze data. So in my mind, uh, I'm kind of hoping that in the next few years there will be a major breakthroughs on, on methods that will have to be developed specifically to address some of these problems. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the examples is uh, cancer-based research, yeah. uh, assuming that then we can uh, have access to billions of uh, cells in a, in a tumor cancer from many, many, many patients. The question will be, what will with the tools that we have today, can we solve that problem? Yeah. Or do we need to think about new technologies, new algorithms, new methods to address those specific challenges? Mm. I, I'm hoping that will be the case. 
Right. And I, and I think like, uh, like, uh, feel free to add more info. I think we did discuss about your contributions and your uh, interest on working in uh, the molecular pathology for cancer. But in terms of uh, layman sense, and also like, feel free to dive deep. How does the AI research that you you see is being uh, used? And as in like, what are like, if, if you see from a completely non-technical standpoint, where are we at? As in what, what, what is the progress being done uh, in medical research? What are the challenges? this and where does ai fit in into the bigger picture of these research like uh is it is it more like just a play tool for people that hey we we worked on this let's try out if ai can do this or is it like something considered as a, a as a very um you know integral part of these analysis so can you can you give us a context of what the what the non technical background looks like and how how does ai fit into that uh domain yeah, so I guess there are, there, are, there are different examples on how the AI actually can fit in, in the different domains. Uh, perhaps I can provide uh, insights on, on two examples. So say sure. on, on, on pathology, uh, uh, now with the digitalizations of pathology, now this is uh, creating uh, a number of uh, needs or, and, and requirements for algorithms and analysis. But I guess, I guess uh, my point is that the immediate, uh, I guess, uh, uh, use case there is on automation, mm-hmm. in a st- and st- automation of steps that before were extremely manual. Uh, nowadays, with the use uh, use of AI, we can do I guess uh, understand the question about quality of image, quality mm-hmm. of uh, of data and uh, provide uh, initial uh, clues for downstream analysis for people so that they can be more, uh, they can increase the productivity. Uh, that perhaps at the high level that is on, maybe on, on pathology. In radiology is a similar story. Uh, nowadays, I guess we, we can ingest lots, lots of data, but I guess uh, we can uh, provide clues to radiologists about uh, diseases. And, and pathologies and can provide that some extent uh, what might be uh, uh, the, uh, an explanation to, to that pathology. So that might be, I guess, uh, uh, an, an, another use case. Be, beyond that, there are, there are also a different number of uh, uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, uh, granular uh, use cases. I see. I see. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I I always like my, one of my brother who works on, I think he works on breast cancer research, but he, he comes from a completely medical standpoint. So he, when we talk, it's more like uh, he's much more intrigued into the idea of using AI or data science. So he's trying his hands on for Python and uh, basic programming. So he always asks me, how can I do that? Because that's the next big thing for him to write in grants. And me on the other hand is normally asking questions because I find cancer research. I don't directly work on this, but it I find like that to be like a very immediate uh, low hanging fruit for using AI into this research yep. because it's it's like very very useful. We have data, we have a good amount of public data sets, so it's 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 an interesting field. Yes, and in perhaps the most meaningful impact on AI is on the single cell analysis. So okay. for, for 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 the reason is that we have access to uh, to the pathology data sets. Uh, typically, I guess, to the work, automated workflows I was kind of alluding to is, uh, at, I guess, at the image level, right? Mm. But uh, understanding and doing an, an analysis at the cell level is tremendous laborious that uh, a human cannot actually do it. So in a data sample, we may have hundreds of thousands of cells. And each cell may be uh, unique as far as an individual, right? If we take, oh. if we map back, I guess the uh, all the protein content of that cell, uh, that might be leading to a very specific bio profile at the cell level. And even more, if we are able to quantify that at, uh, for every cell at the nucleus, membrane, and cytoplasm, and ask the question, what are the uh, the genes that are mostly expressed in these uh, different cell compartments? And if I take a look back now and I look at this at the whole tumor level, can Mm. I ask the question, what is the expression of this cancer? What what is it unique? How is it responding to specific treatments? Now, if I take another uh, step back and I look at this at the cohort level for 100 patients of of medical trial, 
And I ask the same question, I guess that's where the power of these analytical tools might be most, most, I guess, meaningful. Yeah. In, yeah in I, kind I, of, uh, I guess kind of providing uh, measurement analytical tools that humans cannot, uh, I guess, uh, execute just just yeah. because of, of the of the complexity. Similarly, similarly in the in the uh, potential in the radiology, uh, the very large scale models. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's a wonderful explanation because uh, it's it, it, it was funny. I think uh, a few weeks back, I was talking to my parents, and they they still don't understand what I exactly work on. They just know I'm doing a PhD, and when I when I tell them I'm working on medical imaging projects, so they always ask me this one question: You being an engineer, why are you working on medical research problems? You are not signed up for a medical professionals because they they still don't understand the idea of how AI can be potentially used uh, into these uh, research projects. So it's it's a Wonderful. Like I think how you put it at the end was really nice that uh, models or computer-based applications can process these granularities much better. Humans are not built for doing that. We can understand things and work on concept level, but when we are looking very granular and things that we won't, we don't even know what to look for. I think that's um, that's very useful. And 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 I think uh, one one more instance that I can share to that is basically uh, it was only I think more than two years I started working on MRI scans and I always wondered like if if the if the doctors results are so much confident why don't we just uh, hire more radiologists to scan these uh, MRI scans right like that would solve the issue why are we working on from AI level but I think when I actually met a person who was analyzing this MRI scan I actually like knew what are the struggles or actually uh, mm -hmm. diagnosed using an MRI scan. It's not very easy. It's like very hard to do that. It's not a one day, one hour process. It takes a uh, lot of amount of experience, a lot of amount of time. And I think that's when I learned that, hey, these are the costs and automation is what you suggested, right? Like, so even having a 90% confident result will have a significant amount of uh, help on the screening process or uh, the applications could be endless. So yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, but again, I, I want to zoom out and get out of this medical AI domain and ask you more questions as you being a research and a focus on you is the first and the hardest question that one might ask is, should I get a PhD? I want to be the industry. I want to be in, I'm from computer science. I'm, should I be doing a PhD in order to work on research projects? As as yeah. as in the in the same manner as you and your team uh, teammates are working on. So in order to make the same contributions, should I get a PhD in 2022? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I guess the, uh, what, what, when the, I ask, when I am asked that question, uh, my answer is uh, uh, another, another question. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it poses like different. Yeah, but I guess I, I will try to rephrase the question on asking why should I not do oh, a PhD. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I guess might be a slightly different way, but I, I guess I'll try to approach it uh, in that way. Yeah. And uh, and I guess the you have very strong reason reasons of why not doing a PhD might be in the sense like, well, uh, I don't I, I don't really like the research. Well, I'm, it might be that I like the research, but I'm not committed or I don't have the flexibility at this point in my time, uh, my life and my career to dedicate uh, for, for a PhD. And uh, there, there might be others. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my, my recommendation is like, if you don't find a very strong uh, reason of why not, then you should ask, why not do it? <laughs> Yeah, 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 makes sense. I think, yeah, I think the incentives for doing a PhD are as minimal as possible. So I think unless you are um, uh, specifically motivated and 100% sure, and I think like the brother I was mentioning, I, I I took his recommendation for doing a PhD. He also did his PhD, actually University of Houston. So he's actually staying in Houston. So I'm, uh, it's it's a common ground between you two. But he said like, just be, make sure that you are 150% sure of doing a PhD and then only do it because the incentives to stay over yeah. there is uh, minimal. Exactly, okay. and and just and just to complement that question, I guess the follow-up question might be, why why should I do the PhD? Yeah, and I guess the primary metric, uh, I guess for me, will be is this something that I really like? Is this mm. something that I am really extremely passionate about? Yeah. That uh, I'm willing to take a chance. I don't know whether I will have success. Uh, hopefully, that's the case, but I, I will not know if I don't try it. 
yeah but let me let me rephrase the question and maybe like uh what we can talk is as in would phd give anyone a significant advantage that you wouldn't have learned any other way that is helping you in your current job duties that you would say that this can only be done using the these particular scenarios for example you won't uh, like it's hard to have the same amount of uh, coding experience from like let's say a person who is not from technical background who hasn't gone through the rigorous process of like uh, submitting submissions or like the coursework process that goes into a computer science uh, curriculum the other person might not have that much rigor and and coding and coding in a very constrained uh, development uh cycle so do you think the phd course allows you or helps you learn certain things that won't be replaceable uh through other means uh that you think are useful in your current job role in my mind it will be ex- extremely difficult uh, and i guess uh, it, not difficult i will say uh, it might really depend on the type of uh, i guess program or task mm-hmm. that uh, someone is involved uh but but i guess the uh n- nowadays i guess if we take that idea and we ask in the context of analytics and data science uh, i will say the skills that are developed i guess by scientists today mm-hmm. are uh, really uh quite democratized why mm-hmm. because everyone has ex- has access to number one data the most important uh, commodity everyone has access to to computers and mm-hmm. guess what there there are uh, many 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 projects in github and in the internet that can we can use so someone that is self motivated that has a passion about data science can actually use these resources to to achieve similar similar goals mm-hmm. uh the perhaps can the advantage of the phd is that you go over a, a technical training you have uh, expectations as far as a uh, uh, number of publications and, and accomplishments and it's giving you we giving you kind of a, a formal uh training and topics yeah. with advantage that you will have a uh uh an advisor a, a, prof- a professor that is going to be guiding you through that topic and uh, be leading you to solve that specific challenge but, yeah. but i guess what i'm saying is it is feasible but it depends on on the type of a uh, uh, specific path yeah and and just to add on to that i think uh, one of the key things that i learned so again a misconception that i had before i got enrolled into phd uh, and like this was like i i got enrolled into covid time so i met my professor almost one year later so it's what it was hard to have those informal conversations where you are talking anything but project right so like those conversations really help you as in understanding what are your goals from phd right like why did i do that and it was only later that i learned like cs phd has almost least things to do with your coding and your programming skills it is much more about your research skills and it took me like a very long time to understand these two differences right like i i thought like me being a good programmer is going to help me uh get to my 80% of my psd and 20% would be yes i'll be publishing papers and yeah the other other da- like drama that we have to do for in order to get a graduate degree but it was completely different like i think programming skills are like the least important i'm not going to downplay programming it it definitely helps but building a research skill is really uh, useful and so uh, citing back to other experiences and recently the amazon one like i i could see that difference as in unless a person has not done a phd it's very hard for um, um, it's not impossible it, it it's really hard for the other person to connect and get on board and deliver results very fast because uh, they might not have the background so yeah i mean i i, I agree to whatever you said and just uh, a second pointer that i thought like okay yeah this is why i think companies have a mandatory uh, requirement for uh, per phd degree when they look for like i think research scientist roles or something and it makes sense now but when i was in my masters i felt like oh, why why can't i apply for research scientist i have the knowledge i have the experience please hire me but i think yeah i yeah. these are the experiences uh, and then just maybe a note on that i guess for hiring it does not a, it that's a criteria but the note is a compulsory yeah so yeah. so there there are, there are candidates that might not have a phd they have a great uh, research experience and uh, i guess uh, uh that is the, having a phd is useful but uh there are also other merits yeah yeah true true definitely definitely
And and this brings me with like maybe one of the few last questions is, uh, do you have any advice for people uh, who are into AI research, be it like it, there doesn't have to be in the, um, uh, research or specific PhD program, but what kind of things that you would re- recommend people to focus on? Because th- the reason I ask this question, even though it's very redundant, is uh, we have ample amount of information right ample amount of spaces to go to like do i do i focus on uh let's say uh, i don't know diffusion models gan models or synthesis classification computer vision language processing and that i'm I'm sure i'm missing like i think robot planning and all those things and all of them are very interesting for people who are in in research of ai right because they all involve similar kind of techniques at the end different modalities but it's it's it's, so the basic question is like it's very hard to get distracted by so many applications and at the end, not be working on any. So how how would you recommend people who are, uh, how, how would you advise a person who is newly interested in AI? How should he or she uh, navigate his career or her career? Yeah, this? maybe my, my advice will be for uh, someone starting a career on AI is uh, pick a topic, pick something that people are passionate, maybe applications for computer vision, maybe language or speech, speech recognition. And now, uh, Main point is pick something that you will feel passionate and you will feel uh, great uh, spending yeah. the, the time. Second is that uh, read papers. <laughs> <laughs> Let the read papers, many papers as possible. And uh, while reading these papers, then people will start training, uh, will be start learning to differentiate papers, qualities, and uh, different uh, objectives. And they start also developing a a skill, right? On reading a paper. Uh, Second is that um, identify an area that might be, uh, that you actually feel strongly about it or something that you would like to to start if doesn't exist and really go deeply technical on that. Uh, Main point is that uh, uh, applications wise uh, there are many many opportunities there are many public data sets there are many areas but if uh, ident- if someone identifies a specific area and go deep in the technical aspect on the mathematical formulations on what and understanding the technical challenges on implementing those solutions maybe a pretty large scale right yeah that might be setting the initial path in the navigating uh, that uh, that career yeah, 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 and I think you also did mention about reading papers, and I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm just throwing out this question: is do you have any best practice for reading a paper? I think you have been, uh, you have been writing a lot, and that I think uh, one of the things I think my professor mentioned was like writing a paper will change the way how you read a paper. So, uh, like, uh, like what has been the best practice for you to read a paper? If like, uh, if 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 you were to skim read a paper versus really deep dive, how what are the key points that you uh, see in a paper so that you can first of all also learn what the paper is doing and also hopefully criticize saying that uh, no maybe this is wrong or this is not how it's done like w- what are the key stencil that you would recommend anyone to uh, see what's your best practice uh, my best practice is to to look at the merit of the paper uh, mm-hmm. really mainly from the is either kind of a, a, a new application that's kind of uh, very useful but also understanding whether there is kind of a, a new method and then maybe that saying, okay, so this uh, conceptually is uh, is new, but then and I guess the next question will be, can, can we just uh, uh, just kind of strip that application? We can strip the method, understand what is kind of the fundamental principle behind that, how generalizable it is, how applicable are to new situations. Uh, that might be, I guess, one of the main main criteria uh, I use. Other is also uh, how uh, how validations, how people are demonstrating feasibility on this. They might be on data sets that are extremely been to, that have been overanalyzed, if you will, or mm-hmm. there are data sets that are kind of really kind of ch- more more challenging than 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 the average. Uh, that that was kind of one of the main main criteria. But I guess uh, to, going back to our points before, there are many, many I guess, uh, there are many methods that are published. Uh, mm-hmm. Today it's difficult to pick and choose uh, many. But I guess uh, if uh, at, the, at the very least, I guess there are some guidelines, criteria, how people can go through, I guess, pick a, a few, uh, read them uh, whenever, I guess, whenever it's possible. Mm-hmm. And then the, there is a difference, right? From reading the paper to actually understand all the technical details. Yeah. Uh, as, a big, as a best practice, I recommend uh, pick a paper that you like the best, and then the, 
uh, hopefully that's the case most likely that the code is going to be in a, in a repository so mm -hmm. you download the code uh, download the public data set and you debug the code that that is kind of tremendously valuable that mm -hmm. is kind of giving you into all the kind of nuts and bolts on how these things actually work so, and then the main point is like uh, understanding those basic principles then making analogies to some other papers, some other applications is, is becoming more more natural. Yeah. So that might be helpful in maybe how, how to approach uh, different, I guess, technologies, algorithms, applications. No, yeah, they... yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, these are useful insights. And I mean, I, I'm still stuck at the one that I really like the most is uh, basically how you said as like, you analyze the approach and you see how much it is generalizable to other applications or is mm -hmm. it just working on these particular data sets or scenarios? I mean, yeah, I, I love that. I've, I've never like thought on these things in those senses, but yeah, it it, it could be a thing how reviewers approach these uh, scenarios. So yeah, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, but yeah, I think these are the questions that I think I had for you. So uh, yeah, I think we are at the end of podcast. So thanks. I think thanks a lot for doing this. I think we covered from a lot of different topics from your background to uh, the role on understanding the role of a principal scientist to understanding the space of medical AI and also hopefully research. So uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for doing this. I know it's a Friday, so definitely thanks for uh, no, allowing th thank you, me to <laughs> up your afternoon on a Sunday, uh, Friday. So yeah, I appreciate thank you, that. Pleasure to be in the podcast and thank you very much. Thank you.